All right, hello everybody. We have been having fun before we go live. Uh, this is the Vine Memoirs group and their presentations of some of the writing that they've been doing. They have been continuing to meet. As a matter of fact, they've been continuing to meet even more than usual uh, during this COVID time. They have found ways to meet in parking lots, to meet in parks, to meet who knows in back alleys after dark, I'm not sure. But uh, it was their idea to come forward with some uh, present to present some of their writing. Uh, the idea is that I've got those ready to go as PDFs. I hope that they are on the same page as the link for this. That is the idea so that you can read them as, as well as listen to them as we go forward here. But uh, that will be for after the presentation. Right now, I'm going to turn things over to the kind of uh, de facto leader of this memoirs group, and that would be Linda Good. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for putting up with all of us and our um, foibles as we move along. Uh, just a little history of our uh, memoir group. We started meeting in 2012 um, when Carol Peterson came back from her usual sojourn to Arizona and had been a member of a memoir group there. And she said, why don't we have something like that here? And I said, well, let's just start it. So we did. Um, so I want to welcome all of you and I want to invite you if you ever feel so inclined to join our group because we are an open group. We have people coming and going. We don't all make it every week, but we've been having 14 people show up at least every Thursday in the park. And then we also meet on Zoom on Tuesdays right now. So um, we invite anybody to join us. You can just come and listen to us and get a feel for it. Um, and then decide if you want to, you know, be a part of us. Um, everybody has a story to tell. We are not professional writers. We are just telling our stories. And so I welcome you to listen to our stories. And I hope you will get something out of them. Um, what I'm hoping to give you a heads up is that uh, each of us will read something. And then we would like you to ask questions or make a comment about how that story applied to your life or brought up some memories for you. So without further ado, I think we are ready to have our first um, presenter and that is Laura Beely. And she will be reading her recent um, memoir about happiness in unprecedented times. Laura, take it away. Happiness in unprecedented times. Inspired by a recent survey that found only 14% of us said we're very happy, I decided to explore where I could land in the survey, especially during these unprecedented times. Of course, happiness varies with the influences of those things around us in our environment, those things that happen to us, and things such as the weather. And of course, our immediate circumstance, the pandemic. So how in these days of unprecedented times do I stretch and expand boundaries to find happiness in new ways and in new places? Just last February, after January sunny, warm days in Florida and Arizona, we were happily preparing for our Costa Rican adventure. This was a much anticipated trip to explore the rainforests, to explore sea turtles, butterflies, birds, new foods, new culture, and so much more yet unknown. My primary concern last February was taking the right clothes and gear to be comfortable in the Costa Rican climate. Those days seem light years away now. It's interesting to reflect upon the changes in my awareness after we, we returned to the USA the end of February. As March turned into April, I cannot even identify my happiness level because so much energy was expended on reacting to the unfamiliar and searching for the best ways to react to so much unknown. We returned to Minnesota early in March 
because my grandson was to be delivered on March 19th. Baby Milo's birth was to be a celebration of great joy. But that joy became wrapped into my daughter's scary trip to the hospital for the only medical procedure allowed then, a cesarean section. Ariana's doctor was over the age of 60. So she found out that day that he wasn't allowed in the hospital because of his age. Ariana and Eric were met at the hospital door by a hazmat team, as Ariana described it. The maternity ward was silent and empty, except for staff and a few other nervous and scared parents-to-be. We were all scared. I stayed with my not-quite-two-year-old granddaughter during Milo's birth, and that's the last time I've hugged her. We were all receiving unfamiliar messages from the old life as it collided with the new unprecedented times. And the unprecedented times were as the, as the former morphed into the future. No one knew what to expect. What could be feelings of being very happy alive when so much was and is out of balance. Last March and April, I was bottling and storing water, freezing bread, ordering garden seeds on Amazon, pouring over recipes for hand sanitizer, and watching all the calendars upcoming events be canceled, not rescheduled, but canceled. Our April 17th tickets to MSU's Mama Mia are still hanging on the bulletin board. They're still waiting to provide a wonderful evening of entertainment shared with others in the community. Happiness seemed to have taken a back seat mm. to uncertainty, a back seat to confusion, and a back seat to concern. It had become difficult to find lightness with so much heavy unknown filling the days. Though the unknown still looms large, today we know a lot more about COVID-19 than we did six months ago. We are now seasoned stay-at-homers, we are seasoned social distancers, and we are all masked up. We enjoy ourselves out of doors, and we know that fresh air is healthy. I know my own happiness is tied to how I carve it out each day. My happiness doesn't just come skipping down the road of life anymore without me paying attention. Like the stages of grief, I have moved into the acceptance stage on most days. With less time spent fighting the pandemic's restrictions to figure out how to carve out the most joy in the here and now. Golfing, gardening, boating, exploratory car drives, baking, memoirs, porch visits, Marco Polo videos, books, Netflix, and so on. It's been fun to find creative ways to be with other people safely. Even the State Fair found a way to bring people a share food, shared food experience and to address Prado Pup and Cheese Curd withdrawal. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I know full well I am beyond blessed with security, a safe home, an income, food security, healthy friends, healthy family, and a life partner. I should never take these things for granted, though sometimes I do. Still, I'm trying to be intentional in finding my happiness and remaining in the survey's 14% of very happy people. Of paramount importance is to be part of other people's happiness and have meaningful contact with others. Our current predicament requires all of us to commit to the greater happiness as well as the greater good and to carve out happiness each day. It's a priceless gift to be happy and to share happiness with others in these unprecedented times. 
My parting message is don't forget to vote in November and let's hope for tremendous happiness on November 4th. <laughs> Yay, bravo. Like yeah. <laughs> we found our cheese curds at Fleet Farms. That's why we didn't laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask for three comments or questions for Laura. How does this story relate to your life? How are you finding happiness during the pandemic? Well, I was wondering because I know Laura travels a lot and I've been doing some exploring of sites nearer Mankato. I wonder if you've taken any trips, you know, day trips perhaps that you might have overlooked to find your happiness in travel. Oh, definitely. That's I mentioned um, uh, day exploratory car trips. So sometimes we've just driven around the lakes out here where places we haven't been before. Uh, it's really been fun. Um, I We use GPS as uh, Roger and Bev <laughs> um, have have more exploration on their trips <laughs> when, <laughs> when they go places. But yeah, we've made some nice discoveries right around here. Really have a, have grown appreciate, had the appreciation um, for the, the land that's just right around us with the lakes and trees. Um, it's just beautiful. It really is. Any more comments from anybody? Questions? I have I have a question. Hey, Deb. Laura, your um, memoir covers a wide, you know, the full expanse of the pandemic and um, parts of it, to my listening, are very emotional. Did you, did you have a sense of growth as you wrote this? Good question. Yeah, I, I did change it because the last time I read that version of it, it was in July. And I was, um, I think I had a lot more sadness than I have now. Um, the acceptance is there on, a, on a, a greater degree now. So that um, I just, especially when I hear the predictions for how long it might last, uh, it's been not seeing the grandkids that's been the worst, mm -hmm. um, but we've negotiated that with porch visits and, you know, we found the ways to negotiate it. So yeah, it's emotional for everyone. It really, you know, even as we get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it, it's funny, isn't it, when you watch something on television, like I watched the Viking game, <laughs> well, nothing changed there, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when you watch these things that are pre-pandemic and you see people clustering and crowds and go, oh my God, you know, I mean, it's, it's so stark that you recognize that's before, you know, so, um, yep, you're right, Deb, it's been very emotional. Thank you for sharing it. Well, thank you. Can I have one more question or comment from somebody, please? I would like to recommend um, some of the places that we were at that we haven't been at for a long time or never. One of them was the Benson Park in North Mankato. Um, it's just lovely. Uh, it has trails, it's got children's play equipment. It has bathrooms, it has benches, and it has the buffalo statue. And another place that we had been for a long, long time was the Land of Memories Park out on 169 before you get to Minneopa Falls. Um, again, the campsites and all the activities out there. The day we went, there were several teams of Frisbee playing and they have campsites in the sun and campsites in the shade and it's just a wonderful place. And then of course we went to Minneopa several times and Roger, I can't remember the name of the town we went to that's near New Ulm. Hanska. Henderson. Ha no, not Henderson, oh. Hanska, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy remembered. <laughs> Hanska, yes. Hanska. 
That's a, a the Anderson too. neat little town. <laughs> yeah, a really neat little town. So if you haven't been there and you just need to get out of the house, there's a place to drive to. Okay. Thank you, Bev. <laughs> and isn't it interesting how multiple members of this group could tell you where you'd be? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they read my stories. <laughs> Most of the time, we just want to tell Roger where to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been told before, though. <laughs> okay, we need to keep moving forward. So our next reader is Jan Prane. Jan. Whoops, you need to unmute, Jan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll go back in time. Um, this is a childhood memory from the 40s, <clears throat> and I've titled it, Never So Happy to See a Pair of Old Shoes. Growing up in Radcliffe, Iowa, a town of 700, the Iowa State Fair was a big deal to a young girl about seven or eight years old. <clears throat> During the 40s, however, people stayed away from crowds because of the fear of contracting polio. I could barely contain my excitement when I learned we would be going to the state fair. My mother had made me a red and white striped skirt and a midriff sleepless top to match in white trimmed in the red and white striped material, and on the matching top, she had sewn a letter J <clears throat> out of the striped material. I thought it would be the perfect thing to wear to the state fair. The state fair also occurs in August in Iowa, and I had already done some shopping for school clothes. I was thrilled with the purchase of red penny loafers. Of course, I expected to wear my new shoes to the fair, especially since they were a perfect match for my skirt and top. My mother advised me that we would be doing a lot of walking and wearing new shoes would not be the best idea. That made no sense to me at all. <clears throat> I persisted <clears throat> with my request and she finally relented. She was right. There were acres of sights and lots of walking. When my feet began to hurt, I did not want to tell my mother after all, she'd warned me and I had begged to wear them. I did get some rest when my parents and the parents of the other family enjoying the fair with us decided to go into a very large tent to see Sally Rand and the fan dancers. Children were not allowed. We were given strict instructions to wait outside. Oh, I was glad to be able to rest my feet, and it was fun just staring at the big pictures advertising the show and watching the people coming and going. I thought with rest, my feet would be fine again. Sad but true, they still hurt after resting. I put my feet out of my mind when I became enthralled with the stand selling little live chameleons. The man was explaining how chameleons could change their color to match the environment around them. I was fascinated. Each chameleon had a little leash with a safety pin on the end, and you could pin it on your lapel, and the little creature could walk around on your shoulder at the end of the leash. I decided of all the souvenirs available, taking this little live creature home with me would be the most interesting and my parents allowed me to purchase one and pin it on. I began thinking about what I would name it and the chameleon kept me occupied for quite some time, but I was slowing down and walking. My feet still hurt. I did not say a word, but my mom could tell. She did not say anything until we gathered for our picnic lunch. She had me close my eyes and hold out my hands and there in a little bag, were my old shoes. I was never so happy to see a pair of old shoes. Now, when I hear the saying about fitting like an old shoe, I am reminded of my Iowa State Fair experience. I thank my mom for bringing my old shoes and put them on immediately. The rest of the day, I could enjoy the fair in comfort with my new little pet riding around on my shoulder. When we got home that evening, I mean, in working on providing the proper home as instructed by the salesman at the fair. 
a little dish of water was included in the box that I had set up. And the next morning when I went to check on my new little pet, I was devastated to find it dead. Some tears were shed. The only explanation we could come up with was that the cotton leash shrunk from getting wet and choked the poor thing. We had a proper burial in the backyard, much to my mom's embarrassment. As I told about my state fair adventure and the death of my chameleon, I also told our friends and neighbors about the Sally Rand show my parents saw. <laughs> <laughs> I can never recall this experience without remembering one of my childhood poems. <clears throat> and so I will share that with you now. And it's titled Choosing Shoes. New shoes, new shoes, red and pink and blue shoes. Tell me, what would you choose if they'd let you buy? Buckle shoes, bow shoes, pretty pointy toe shoes, snappy cappy low shoes, Let's have some to try. Bright shoes, white shoes, dandy dance by night shoes, perhaps a little tight shoes. Like some? So would I. But fat shoes, flat shoes, stump along like that shoes, wipe them on the mat shoes. That's the sort they'll buy. <clears throat> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Jan. You had so much in there that people might want to comment about. State fairs, chameleons as pets, your shoes, uh, Sally Rand. <laughs> Who would like to give us three questions or qu comments to uh, Jan? Uh, I would. Thank you. Uh, the, your mention of the polio uh, uh, epidemic Wow. I brought back some memories for me. Um, we were going to country school, and my parents were really concerned that in, in that very small group, maybe 12, 15, that especially our, my little sister that was in first grade. Mm -hmm. So they kept her home all fall, didn't let her go to school. And after I married my husband, I found out that his sister indeed had had polio, was in an iron lung for... Uh, months and months and always had a limp after that mm -hmm. so uh, and I meet people that are about that age that have a limp or have an insert in their shoes or something and they will say mm -hmm. they will explain well I had polio and my I think my parents were just as anxious as we are about some of the things today about mm -hmm. polio mm -hmm. thank you Karen who else are we going to hear from with a comment or question <clears throat> Just sticking with the polio theme, um, Bailey Bluffton uh, in town, I think most people know Bailey, had polio as a child, and it reoccurred in later life, not exactly reoccurred, mm -hmm. but he had a real setback from the polio, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't realize that happened, yeah. and I don't think uh, we know about COVID-19, That's right. whether or not that will reoccur and cause problems later in life for people. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, something to think about when you don't want to put that mask on. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those people who like to go to politics and not have masks, it's very dangerous stuff. It's still an unknown. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Roger. One more comment or question, and then we'll move on to our next reading. Who was Sally Rand? <laughs> <laughs> well, in those days, it would have been a risque fan dance. You know, it would be women scantily clothed with doing a performance with fans. So that's who Sally Rand was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, and we'll move on to our next reader, who is Mira Frank, and she is going to read one of her poems called Chicago Southside, 1957. Mira, take it away. Hello. Um, I'm in a, a poetry group, and we've been um, reading poets that write about race and culture, and so that was like the genesis of, you know, of where this 
well, I mean, the genesis was from my experience, but that's why I, I um, wrote it at this time. Chicago South Side, 1957. Each Sunday afternoon, Emma visits her grandmother. She attends Catholic school. I go to the neighborhood public school. We are both 10 years, about the same height. Emma has straight blonde hair and blue eyes. My hair is curly brown, and I also have blue eyes. We visit on grandma's porch, share stories, read aloud Nancy Drew mysteries, play jacks, cut out paper dolls. The Sunday after Easter, I ring her doorbell. The door opens. Emma latches the screen, says, I can't play with you anymore. You killed Christ. The door shut. That's a very powerful remembering of a negative event in your life, plus some positives before that, but the betrayal at the end. Um, can I have three comments or questions for Mira? Mira, did you never then have any more contact and so never um, <clears throat> had any more explanation? How did, was that just, nothing in the future or any more contact? I, I had, um, yeah, that was the end of the contact for her. And I was actually looking up some stuff about Vatican II because it was during Vatican II in the 60s when, um, when the, the church, um, and it was very controversial in Vatican VI, but you know, that they said that, um, that everybody was to blame. And um, if Barb Jackman was here, Reverend Barb, I mean, she talks about um, that we were all Jews then. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, that, that was it. And um, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a comment. Um, <clears throat> I'm surprised, I've been in memoirs a few years, I'm surprised how writing, or sometimes poetry for me as well, helps me work through some things that are just kind of scratching in my head or my heart. Do you find that to be true? Oh, what a great question. Um, so like with this poem, I, I feel like, and, and I'll be reading another poem a couple people later. Um, that I'm, I'm hoping I can use it in some way to open conversations. And I think that would be important to me, especially, you know, in these times when, um, you know, when we're becoming much more sensitive to racial issues and how different groups of people are treated. Um, thank you. Did that your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Here, can I have one more comment or question for Mira, please? I, I guess what struck me perhaps is the fact that sadly, in many ways, we as a society seem to be circling back around to the time when little Emma at the door making this kind of statement is getting to be more prevalent. And that's a very sad commentary in itself. And I wonder if it's more prevalent or people are talking about it now. And I think the talking about it gives me hope that we'll all rise together. Thanks. Thank you, Mira. That was a, that was a hard one to listen to sometimes. Um, it jolts us into realizing that uh, not everybody's accepted like we'd like them to be. So thank you for sharing. Um, I am the next reader because Barb Jackman needed to bow out. So I am the replacement reader. And this is a memoir that I wrote on July 10th, 2017. I overheard him say, look at the old lady, as he splashed in the water at Hineker Pond with his sister. I kind of chuckled to myself as he said this, but then it occurred to me that he was talking about me. 
he had probably based his assessment of me on my gray hair because he couldn't see much more of me in the water. I had not thought of it before, but I am a bit of an anomaly at Hinnaker Pond. If a painter were to come represent the scene at Hinnaker Pond, the picture would show a grassy hillside descending to a sandy beach. At the top of the grassy hill, there would be picnic tables with families of older people sitting around those tables, looking at the pond and visiting with one another. There would be people sunning on towels or blankets near the water, checking their phones and sipping on a beverage or reading a book. The small children might be sitting on the shore with their sand toys, contenting themselves with digging in the sand. The water in the buoyed designated swim area of the beach would be peopled with little people and a few parents supervising them. The babies and toddlers would be near shore with their floaties on their arms. They might be sitting in the shallow water or toddling out to a parent. The young children would be splashing, diving underwater, having contests to see how long they could hold their breath underwater, and perhaps playing with a ball or inflated water toys. Beyond the young children outside the buoyed area, where the water is deeper, the teenage boys would be found throwing footballs back and forth. There might also be some teenage girls sunning themselves on floaties in close proximity to one, to one another and the boys. Occasionally, the teenage boys might challenge one another to swim across the pond. In the deeper water, approaching the middle of the pond, one might see the older college students on their floaties, sometimes on floaties large enough to accommodate several adults, often with a can of some beverage in their hand. Occasionally, there might be people in kayaks or on stand-up boards traversing the width of the pond, but if one is watching closely, an old lady might be seen swimming around the perimeter of the pond. So seeing an old lady in the water was a novelty to these children. <clears throat> How does she do that, the boy said, as he watched me doing my end of routine, surface level sit-ups as I come into shore. As, my way, oh, sorry. <laughs> as I made my way under the rope of the buoys, and headed into the swim area, he addressed me directly. Hey, old lady, he said. <laughs> well, I am old and I hope that I'm a lady, but it is more polite to call me a grandma because I am a grandma and a great grandma. His mother, <clears throat> standing in the shallow water said, I'm sorry, he has no filter. <laughs> I replied, that's okay. I know that young children say what they see and can be brutally honest at times. The mother apologized again. I wish that I had been more quick-witted. I could have asked the children if I was the old lady who swallowed a fly or the old lady who lived in a shoe. Nursery rhymes do not do justice to senior citizens. I wish I had stayed a bit longer and played with them, having them jump off my shoulders like I used to have my grandchildren do when they were small but I had finished my hour long swim and had errands to do before I came home. So I left the water with thoughts of my being the only old lady in the pond. <laughs> okay, three questions or comments from anybody. Well, I really get surprised sometimes at the reaction of someone to me, um, I was in the clinic not too long ago, and to my surprise, uh, there was a young, young woman, uh, and when she saw me coming, she immediately jumped up so I could sit in her chair, and it's like, oh wow, I'm that old now. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while for us to realize we're old, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't think of either of you as old. You're both so vibrant and active that, you know, it may you may have gray hair, but that's about the only thing that gives it away. 
Yeah. Well, it just takes you by surprise. You haven't been thinking of yourself in that way. And right. <laughs> well, I was... What it made me think of, and Kathy maybe will remember this too, because when I was in high school, that wasn't the the cool park and pond that you described. It was the pit. <laughs> <laughs> and sneaking out to the pit was was almost naughty. So yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, a lot of skinny dipping, and people who went to the pit were taking chances. <laughs> so that's what it made me think of being a very young lady. <laughs> right, right. Well, I remember um, John Hineker, who owned the pit, was a friend, and he said the city told him that either he sold to them or he undertook the expense of fencing it in so that no one could get in because it was an attractive nuisance. And so he decided he would have to sell it. So that's how the city acquired the pit. And it's actually in Mankato, yeah. not North Mankato, yeah. that whole area. Really? Um, the area of Mankato, the boundary followed the old riverbed. So things aren't always in the same city that you think. So an attractive nuisance is like good trouble, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and that leads me to John Lewis. Mind taking a side for a second, Linda? Sure. Uh, I'm getting you the John Lewis book, and your water made me think of... Uh, he began his preaching to the chickens on his farm. He decided to baptize one. <laughs> and he held it in the water and the little creek too long and it drowned. So he, after he baptized the chicken, he wondered if he was really made to be a preacher. Uh, he, yeah. he, killed him. he killed his first baptism. But the chicken came back to life later. A great read, by the way, for those of you who are interested. Thanks, Roger. Okay, well, I just move, whoops, more comments? Well, I just have to add this. I recently saw a t-shirt that has a new term for the aging senior woman, and that's a queen-ager. Uh, <laughs> I can make a, a little comment that I think I saw that just yesterday in the free press that they're talking about developing in a Gerbon. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Hineker Pond, as we know, it may not be that long. So, well, I, I think they're developing around it, the mm -hmm. area where the bowling alley is yeah. and some of the lighter industrial across there too. I think they want to take advantage of the beauty of the of Hineker Pond. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to our next reader, and that is Karen Verberg. And she's going to read about mouse encounters. Well, this is a part of, uh, from my book that is my memo memoirs. It's about 80 pages long. So um, naturally, I, uh, since I'm, I lived in the Dakota Plains, um, I needed to write about the country school experience. The late... 1940s in a Dakota Plains country school grades one and eight. I spent one winter as a trapper. When the trapping season was announced, our little band from Sunnyside Country School went home in anticipation of finding a trap or two. I think my brother Jerry and I found two traps we shared. Pelts were worth five cents that year. Five cents then would buy a Hershey candy bar or whatever kind you wanted. That meant if you had a successful night, you could get two candy bars from one night's trapping. We were very competitive and not always so nice to each other. We each knew the best places to have our trap. We did not have kindly thoughts toward one another if our trap was not one of the other traps that held the stiff little body. I am quite sure that when my teacher, Miss Kaiser, went to teacher's training, one of her methods class had a section on how teachers were to act if they encountered a mouse in the classroom. Miss Kaiser must have learned her part very well when the teachers-to-be practiced this lesson. 
a little furry creature would come under the door and then bolt into the classroom. Miss Kaiser would immediately rise to the occasion, up on her chair or desk, and scream. Miss Kaiser had an ingenious solution. She would pay five cents for each mouse we trapped. Part of the bargain was we had to empty the trap outside. When the, tra tra when the trapping was slim inside, a few of us had the brilliant idea of putting our traps outside in the outhouses. These yielded success every night. However, then Miss Kaiser was unwilling to reward our services. At home, I had two intimate encounters with a mouse. After dad finished off the upstairs, we kids slept up there. We actually were in the attic as the house was only a story and a half. There was a small three foot by three foot opening above the pantry with a step ladder set upon the base cupboards. The house was not insulated and it was very cold up there. The kitchen below was heated by a cook stove and by morning the fire would be out. Mama had taken a pair of long underwear and dyed them bright pink. I wore those and snuggled down in a big pile of quilts. One night, I woke to discover I was sharing my bed with a mouse. It drew near to my warmth. I reached down until I felt the furry body, flung him out, turned over, and went back to sleep. That mouse survived the experience for it wasn't about the next morning, but it never returned. There was a period of time we kept sacks of chicken feed out in the garage. Mama had cut had put a large empty tin can down in the sack to scoop up the feed. I was doing chores and reached down in the sack to get some feed. The surprised mouse ran up into my parka sleeve. When it reached the middle of my forearm, I grabbed the unfamiliar bump in my parka sleeve and squeezed. That mouse did not survive the experience. <laughs> Okay, what memories did that bring back to any of you? Remember to unmute if you want to say something. I can add a tiny little remembrance. Um, I used to work in a computer factory and at lunch one day someone said, Look by the, under the window at the floorboards and a tiny little mouse came out with like perfect Mickey Mouse ears and then like scooted back. And I would never have, ex I mean, I really didn't know that much about mice and I was surprised. It was probably in the mid eighties. <laughs> and we made, you know, computer parts and had clean rooms, but there were also mice. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. Somebody else want to make a comment that you've had experiences with mice or um, school back in the 40s? I will mention that uh, for a while in the early 2000s, I think I lived down on Cross Street in Lower North Mankato. I was in the upstairs apartment of a, a duplex, basically. And at that time, Nicollet County or Nicollet Avenue was being dug up. They were replacing all the mains and everything. Well. I was, you know, not too far out of college, so my box spring and mattress sat right on the floor. I came home one day during that construction, went into my bedroom, and was greeted by this cute little mouse sitting on the pillow of, of my bed. I immediately ran off, at, probably to Randall's, Matson's, and got some traps. And there were, for the next few days, I would put a trap out on the counter in the kitchen. By the time I got back to my chair in the living room, I would hear it snap and mm -hmm. I'd have to go and deposit that mouse out in the backyard so I could reload the trap. And that's how I got my exercise for a little while was, was going back and forth, setting that trap and emptying it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Anybody else have a story they want to share? I'll tell a little bat story. At Laketon Junior, I had bats and they were very bothersome. But the biggest night of the year at Lincoln, we had open house, parents came to school, and we ran a regular class schedule. 
So parents would sit for, I think the classes were 10, 15 minutes, and teachers would tell what they were doing with their kids. That was the night the bats decided to come in mass. And uh, we were mm -hmm. able to get through that evening rather quickly. The crowd diminished so fast <laughs> that uh, we were on our own and uh, we went to coffee. So, yeah, I mean, the, the halls were filled with those. Oh, yeah, bats to me are nothing more than mice with wings. <laughs> That's what they are. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're mosquito well, eaters. Yes, they're, they are very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. After my husband died, it became my responsibility, because I live here alone, to deal with mice, and it was not a welcome responsibility. <laughs> Because I was like that teacher that was trained by Karen. You get up on the desk yeah. and scream. <laughs> well, you can't do that when you have to deal with it yourself. So uh, one of those growth experiences, huh? <laughs> okay, let's hear from Mira Frank again. She has another poem for us entitled Diversity Presentation. Mira? Hello. <laughs> I feel a bit hesitant because this one has the same tenor, you know, as the first one. And um, I, I had actually um, read these at, um, at Spring Lake Park and people said, oh, you know, why don't you bring those and read them? Um, and this is also written um, over the last couple months in this um, class I'm taking um, about um, different poets and we've been reading a lot of black poets and one of the poets we read was Claudia Rankin and um, the style I'm writing this in the second person using you um, is a style that I thought fit this poem but that's where it came from um, and so I'm, I'm trying to learn new things about um, poetry too. Um, diversity presentation Get to know your Somali neighbors. You walk into the hotel and join 200 other white, mostly female social service professionals. Farms and small towns surround the city of 50,000 people. Sitting in rows of chairs, you face the middle-aged Somali speaker. He shares cultural and religious anecdotes. Someone asks, what would bring peace to the world? He responds, if there were no Jews, you hold your breath. Hope someone will say something. Roger or Bill? I can't hear when you talk, Bill, that's for sure. Roger and Bill played? Roger has. <laughs> oh, I missed that, Dan. Yes. Hmm. You hold your breath, hope someone will say something. There's silence, no embarrassment, no surprise. After the presentation, you approach the speaker. Oh, you must be Jewish. He turns his back. Thanks. Another powerful um, writing that makes us really look at ourselves in a lot of ways too. And it may not be that we are addressing Jews, but we might be saying something just offhand that we just don't even think about. Um, like that speaker didn't think about um, offending somebody by making such a brash statement. Uh, can I have some comments from some other people, please? Or questions? Well, uh when I, I'd heard it before, but when I heard it again, it's just like, you just like you feel this big thing descending into your body. It's just like, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's not a small thing. You know, it's like something big and heavy, that, that incident. Mm -hmm. It's Thank a you. reminder that many of us have forgotten about that it is still an issue mm -hmm. and there's still wars going on over it. And it's just sad. My heart broke for you, Mira, when you read that. I just couldn't believe it that we're still talking about 
um, Jews in that way. It's always, a, it's always inappropriate to label a whole group because of maybe one negative experience we might have had with somebody that we perceive as representative of that group. We all know that there's diversity within any group. And there are, um, I'm Polish, there are some Poles I don't want to be around, <laughs> but I'm not going to blame every Pole for the problems of the world. Um, and so it's just really, we have to learn to confront people, I think, when they make a statement like that, that uh, we're, we're somehow conspiratorial when we don't call their attention to it. Um, I think it's just a lack of awareness. That it's just something that's a part of them that they, they're just not even aware of. Um, I will give an example, and I've given this to the memoir group before, so sorry people, but you're gonna hear it again. Um, when I was teaching in South Dakota, I had a Native American student in my class. And my classes were three hours long. So by the end of three hours, students were really ready to get out of there. And I could see that they were starting to gather up their backpacks, putting their papers away, et cetera. And so I, I don't even remember saying, making this statement, but they affirmed that I did say it. I said, oh, looks like the natives are restless. It must be time to go. Well, within a couple days, I received a note from that Native American student saying how I made her feel like a savage who couldn't sit still in class. And I was just like, did I say that? Wow, I don't even know I said that. It was just, it's just part of my, the phrases that we throw out. And um, then I consulted with some of my colleagues and I said, what do you think of when you hear the statement, the natives are restless? And they said, oh, we think about the natives in Africa. And I said, oh no, now I've offended another group of people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I um, contacted that student and apologized and told her I appreciated her calling my attention to it, that I was totally unaware, did not even remember making the statement. And um, then I apologized in front of the whole class and said, please call me on this if I make statements like this. I need to grow and, you need, and we'll all grow together through this. So I think so much of it is that we're unaware and we need to call people's attention to it. And I think writing a poem like you did, Mira, is a way of making people aware. As Bev said, we don't even think about it anymore. We think it's a non-issue. So we need to be, have our awareness raised. One of the things that, that I've noticed is it's okay if we use these slurs as long as that group isn't there. Oh. Which is different than, you know, like the example you're giving about, I didn't think about it. And um, yeah, thanks. Do you think there was an assumption that there were no Jewish people in the audience? That this person could make that statement? Well, there are very few Jews that live in Mankato. So, um, yeah. and when I have heard remarks um, and, you know, would ask about it, like I did in, in this situation, um, I get responses like, oh, we all think like this, like it, it's okay oh. and, um, to kind of, you know, talk to Mike's point before, just because people aren't talking about it doesn't mean that, you know, those, ki that those kind of thoughts haven't been going on. And I also appreciate that it's not just about Jews. I, that happens to be, you know, where I'm sensitive, but it's, you know, all kinds of people. And, um, and that it, I think it's something that is an issue that's up now and that the strength is coming together and talking about it. I was, um, I, I've read a lot of um, blacks who comment on, they have to be the ones who stand up and say something, you know, that other people aren't standing up. And I think a lot of the um, books about anti-racism and white privilege are, are really, you know, trying to address 
you know, this is an issue for all of us. It isn't, it shouldn't just be a minority group, um, any kind of minority group, um, you know, would be dealing with. And that was a part about, you know, there's silence, no embarrassment, no surprise. And then um, I would have been fine to talk to him about it. Like, you're not going to get further if someone just walks away. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he would have nothing to do with that. So there, there was, um, so that conversation ended. Yeah. Well, that's also yeah. interesting because he was likely a Muslim if he was a Somali speaker. Right. He was. And you think he would be sensitive to minority issues, but. I, I've, you know, heard, I, I, I've heard from people around town that that's, um, yeah, it, it's us and them. And I think as a social worker and as a Jew, I've always felt like it was us. There is no them. You know, I mean, we might have different habits or different interests, yeah. but, you know, how what do we- came to mind, What came to mind? What came to mind? Scapegoat. You're cutting out, uh, Laura. Keep trying. Yeah. A number of ways and is- Oh, I looked up the definition of scapegoat. A person or a group of people who are blamed for the wrongdoings, mistakes, and faults of others, especially for reasons of expediency. So I thought the reasons of expediency was an interesting part of the definition. Just to blanketly scapegoat whole groups of people it may not even be based on the meeting of one or two people. You may have never met anybody, but it's a convenient scapegoat. So. Okay, thank you, Laura. And thank um, you, Mira. Mira, I, I just like to say how much I appreciate your, the way you can say something uh, with just a few words. And you know, it, you're certainly a case where uh, Less is more. Yeah. And uh, it was very beautifully done. Thank you. I, I've worked on this story and it, it's been different things, but I, I, I was, you know, working toward that. So thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to our final reader of the day. And that is Deb Fitzloff, who is going to share a bit of joy with us about her 4th of July experience. Deb. Thank you. Um, I get to, I just want to say how great it is. I've heard many of these before at our memoirs and just like a good song, you can't, <laughs> you just want to hear it again. So thank you. Um, my husband, Steve and I have lived in Mankato for four years now, but we have never experienced the city fireworks display that is so popular. I invite you now to come along with us as we try to find out about this. The title of my memoir is 4th of July, 2019. It is a warm, calm evening across the city of Mankato. Earlier in the day, we had purchased a pack of supersized sparklers. We fire them up at dusk, swirling them around in the air, higher in the sky, a sliver of moon, and in the grasses below, fireflies offer their own silent light shows. Energized, primed for more, we hop in the car for a drive around Mankato, for it now is dark. It is nearly 9.30. So traveling down Warren, we begin to notice on the sidewalks a few people walking and then in groups and families with chairs and children in tow. Taking a right on 2nd Street now, many more pedestrians and kids on bikes and skateboards. It is slow going with the traffic and the darkness and folks crossing in front of us. We realize everyone is navigating toward the river and every random parking space and lot is filled or filling up fast. This must be big. At Mulberry, we discovered the bridge, all the lanes are closed to traffic. And the bridge deck has become like a park, a gathering spot. 
So we circle the Coffee Hag block and head south on Riverfront. People have found viewing locations in the higher levels of the parking ramps. You see their side-by-side -side dark silhouettes against the sky. At the YMCA, we head back, taking 169 over the river and toward North Mankato. The exit ramp to Belgrade is closed, but this time we are not surprised. Traveling along 169, the top of the levee is full of people set up on the bike path for a good view. And once again, cars parked everywhere. Glancing across the river at Mankato, we catch random fireworks silently blossoming above the hilly dark landscape. We exit onto Highway 14 East and then South Victory heading for home. It has been an amazing display of people, of holiday, of anticipation. We pull in the garage just at 10 o'clock and walk into the house mid booms and sizzles as Mankato's annual 4th of July show begins. We step out onto our bedroom balcony overlooking Glenwood Avenue and the city. We see the very tops of the highest fireworks through the trees. And here, smaller celebrations nearby. And now and then, a rapid chatter of a string of fireworks. And in the pause, from the woods, just below us, a barred owl hoots. It was wonderful, rich light and sound celebrating life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. You are so descriptive. Can I have three questions or comments about celebrating the 4th of July and fireworks and whatever else this might have elicited from you? Well, I'll uh, say something. Um, for the 22 years I lived in Alaska, it does not get dark on July 4th. And the every year I would miss, because they would shoot fireworks up into the dusky colored sky, but that's it wasn't dark. And I would tell the kids growing up I'm in the Midwest, when it gets dark, there are fireworks and I'm going to take you down there. We did. I brought them down once to just experience a 4th of July with a dark sky so you could see the fireworks. And I think of that. That's one of the holidays when I lived up there um, that I absolutely missed the most was, uh, was uh, the 4th of July celebration. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, I, have I, have a, I have a childhood book. And in the story, it's the story of all these little different mice are looking at an elephant and they all try to tell each other what an elephant is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one sees a trunk and one sees this and one sees that. And they come to all these different perspectives about what the creature is. And uh, I just thank you, Deb, for giving us another view of Fourth of July. Uh, from your from your perspective, uh, it was beautifully done. Thank you, Karen. I had to mute because the lawnmower just went by. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to make a comment, please unmute so we can hear you. Rogers, muted. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Deb's going to go help him. <laughs> Usually she wouldn't mind that, but today. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, I'm coming. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought it was interesting how even though you didn't really get to watch the fireworks, you just found yeah. such joy in watching everything else about the 4th of July. Thank you. It was, it's almost like, in, do you ever, do you ever, 
are you ever in a big group where someone's pictures are are being taken and instead of yeah. taking a picture of the focus of the yeah. event you turn and take a picture of all the people taking the picture because they're so happy it was like that <laughs> Jeb. yeah did you did you leave the house you and steve with the intention of seeing the fireworks and at some point without you it sounds like without even talking about it you just let go of the actual viewing the fireworks and you both knew that the experience was complete without seeing the fireworks but did you talk about it at all or did it just just unfolded is the way it sounds Yes, I think that's true. Um, it just became so clear that if we had really wanted to see the fireworks, we should probably have, you know, gotten going a lot earlier. <laughs> right. And it turned out to be, I think I had to write about it because it was such a wonderful drive around, you know, and then to have the then to have the owl at the end, you know, be right in, when that owl hoots in our ravine, it feels like it's right on the, on the deck. It's so clear. Thank you. Anybody Deb, else? Uh, Deb, it brought back a memory. Um, <clears throat> my daughter-in-law is English and her parents wanted to visit us over the 4th of July because they wanted to experience what the 4th of July was like in the U.S. And they came and St. Peter goes all out <laughs> with a parade and <clears throat> old fashioned 4th of July celebration at the park and then fireworks at night. So it was a long day and it was very, very hot. But I think they got what they were wanting to experience. So that was the important thing. I live on Belgrade, and so I can walk over there, um, don't have to deal with cars and stuff. So I, I kept like waiting for you to, oh, we're going to park here. You know, there's still some spaces. And, and so that was interesting. I, I like, you know, the way, Laura, that you were framing it because, you know, I wondered about that. So I'm able to just walk over there, walk into the park, walk back and, um, and be minimally be easily be on the bridge and watch um, a great place to watch the fireworks is, is from the bridge between Mankato and North Mankato. Okay. Well, that was, those were all of our readers for today. Um, I invite people to join us. We will be, well, most of us will be in the park on Thursday at 10 o'clock at Sibley at uh, Spring Lake Park. Uh, we meet in the shelter closest to the pond between the pool and the ball fields. I unfortunately will not be there because I'm having retinal surgery tomorrow. So I'm going to miss a couple times, but every, I'm sure the group will be there. They just keep coming on out. Um, we also have a Zoom connection on Tuesdays. So if any of you who are not members of our group want to be included, um, let me know and I will, uh, or let Mike know, and we will make sure that you get um, the code for the Zoom meeting. Um, we, as you saw, a variety of our writings today. Uh, most of the time we write on whatever we choose to write on. Occasionally we will do an all together write, and we will all write on the same topic, and just see the various perspectives that come out about Oh, outhouses or shoes or, oh, I can't even remember all the things we've written about over the years, but um, it's always a joy to just hear different perspectives. We are not professional writers, but we enjoy hearing our stories. And we know from research that if you write down your story and later on in life have memory issues, it's a wonderful source for someone to pull out that story and read to you to help jar your memory. Um, it's also a nice legacy to leave to our children or grandchildren so that they can better understand us. Hopefully they'll wanna read something um, about us later in life um, when they're a little bit more mature maybe. <laughs> um, I know that I regret not having 
something more about my mother, my father, my grandparents, um, that I wish that I could ask them questions now and get clarification. Um, so we really enjoy um, sharing our memories. And so I hope that some of you might want to join us in the future, either on Zoom or in the park. And uh, Mike, do you have any word on when we might be able to get back into Vine again? I really don't. I just, uh, I know that you mentioned you sometimes have about a dozen or so people. Right now we are still at the 10 person limit basically for groups that gather here. Mm -hmm. So I would say that for the time being at least, we're probably looking at, at a while. I can take a look to see if our largest room, of course, upstairs would be available. That would not be as intimate or as cozy as you're probably used to. Uh, I don't think we want to have a, uh, a mic system that <laughs> allows you to speak from across the room, uh, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Okay, well, thanks, Mike. You know, we are social distancing in the park. Mm -hmm. We are six feet apart from each other. We're wearing our mask. Um, so we, um, we're honoring and taking care of each other <laughs> through this whole process too. So um, anyway, if you have a story to tell, and we all have stories, <laughs> And they can be about anything. Look at the variety of today, from stories from our past about wearing uh, new shoes to a, a state fair and finding the consequences of that, to uh, catching ma mice in a classroom when you're a child, to uh, my encounter at Hineker with being called an old lady, um, to Mira's thought-provoking, um, awareness-raising poems about uh, what it's like to be Jewish and to be rejected and to be blamed. Um, and then the joy that came out with Laura's talking about finding happiness in the pandemic. And of course, Deb with her 4th of July celebration. So we are all over the place. Sometimes we do a lot of laughing, but sometimes we cry. And we do have um, a code that we honor confidentiality. Um, of course, we're publicly sharing today. But it, when we're together, we say, you know, if, if something strikes you and you want to tell people about our stories, just leave the names off so that we can protect each other. Um, and um, so we are, we're very trusting. Uh, we are an extended family. The memoir group goes beyond writing memoirs. We've had in the past um, Halloween parties, costume parties for all of us. We've had potlucks. We've gone on sculpture walks. Some of us have gone on some little mini trips together. So warning, if you join the memoir group, um, it's more than memoirs. <laughs> Anybody else from the group want to make some comments before we say goodbye? You didn't say anything about treats. Oh. <laughs> That's also fattening. <laughs> We do have treats every week, and so, um, yeah. <laughs> Two people here. I think I'd like to add one quick thing. Being new to a group that had been established for a while, there was no issue with feeling welcome and joining right in and feeling part of the group. So if new, if people are considering joining, it's very easy to become part of this family, I think. <laughs> Anyone else? I just okay. want to take this opportunity to remind people that this will be done again in two weeks. Yes. Uh, it would be best if you, if you plan to attend that you register at the, at the Vine website. I may toss out some invitations to people who were uh, registered for today, even if they're not on there for next time, but it's always best if you can uh, be forthcoming and let us know that you're going to be here, perhaps. I would, if, if any of those who are not in our memoir group would like to make a comment, I, I'd really appreciate hearing some feedback. Is this worthwhile for us to share our stories with you? Um, are you ever going to come back again <laughs> to listen to us? <laughs> Uh, any of you who are there, would you like to share some comments, some feedback for us before we have to say goodbye? Well, I can. I, I got to listen to you. It's probably a couple years ago um, 
down at Vine, and I really enjoyed listening. And I'm not a great listener. Those of you that know me, I'm a big talker, so it's a good it's good for me. Um, when you say two weeks, what do you mean though? In two weeks, Mike, I'm a little confused about that. Does we that are mean doing you? we are doing this again on the 28th of this the month. The public public sharing. Right. Yep. Oh, okay. Two okay. stories, not the same ones, not okay. the same people. Well, I would like to do this, but I'm going to have to do some writing first. <laughs> I'm more about, I tell a lot of stories, but I don't usually write them down. But you're right that, you know, I recently was cleaning a little in the basement and I came across um, some writing that my brother made my mother do. And I'll just share with you the thought that popped in when you, you never know, you know, when your kids might read this. My mother grew up like a family of like 12 and very in poverty, basically. But what she said in there was, I was determined that my house would be clean and my children would have nice clothing. I never knew that. I mean, is that how she lived? Yes. But I didn't know where it came from. So with that, I, I pass. But thank you all for sharing. You're a very special group. You'll probably see more of me if I find time to write. So. Well, thanks, Mary. And we encourage people to just come and, and sit in with us and get a feel for it. You don't necessarily have to have something written every time, because um, there are so many of us that uh, we don't necessarily have time to listen to everybody. <laughs> so just come and listen, and then maybe you'll get hooked on us like we are. <laughs> Anybody else who's been listening want to make a comment, some feedback for us? Uh, somebody who's not in our group. I'm looking. Webster's, what about you? You're muted. And Agnes, do you have yes. anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, I'm just uh, apologizing because I forgot to sign in at two o'clock. <laughs> but, I, but I listened for a while and I... I wish I had heard all of them, but I didn't. Okay. It would have been fun to We're hear. doing it again September 28th, 2 to 3.30, so join I, us. I am going to try really hard to remember that because Mike was good enough to, you know, register me and give me instructions, but he didn't instruct me to be there at 2. <laughs> A lot of us are having problems with time issues during this pandemic. I, well, I, you know, I, I set jigsaw puzzles all the time, and I got into that and forgot. Mm. I love to set jigsaw puzzles. Would you Am like I to give me, give you, have you, give you, would you like me to give you a call, Ag, to let you, to remind you? Uh, you know, you could, but you know, I no, I think I need to trust myself. Okay. <laughs> yep, I need to do that. But thank you anyway. Okay. Nice to see you, Ag. I haven't seen you in. Oh, ten. hi, Laura, my old friend <laughs> Laura. Not old, but my friend, former friend Laura. I've known Laura for a long, long, <laughs> long time. I haven't seen you in a long time, so it's really nice to see you pop up at the bottom of my screen. I know, I know. <laughs> With all my wrinkles and all that kind of good stuff. I could write a story about wrinkles. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one. That would be a good one. I have many. <laughs> uh, Webster's, do you want to unmute and tell us any feedback you have for us? Well, because I saw such a limited num uh, you know, amount of it, I don't have uh, any particular comment, except I think you guys have a lot of fun. We do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah. And it is true. We all have memories buried inside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the things that happens in our group is that when we listen to each other's stories, it spurs more memories within us. It does. We're more inspired. Yeah, it does. Okay. I, do have, I do have to share something just personal. Um, 
I just attended my 71st class reunion. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. How uh, many people were there? Um, well, um, I wish I could stretch it, but I better not. There were seven of us. That's, mm. that's good. I should mention that in our memoir group, we have members who are in their 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, and I believe our oldest member is 90 right now. Well, I'm almost there. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we all have stories to tell. Yes. I think it's probably time for us to sign off, isn't it, Mike? Yep. I'm, I think I interrupted you guys. <laughs> that was rude. Thank you all for being with us today and listening and um, giving us some feedback, maybe giving us some comments and questions. Maybe we've spurred some things you want to think about. Maybe you want to put a pen to paper. So uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And uh, Mike, are you going to sign off for all of us? Well, I think you pretty much just did, but uh, I will just say that uh, thank you all for coming today. We have been building a bit in numbers. This is one of our larger groups that's come together for a presentation, but we do have things going on all, all the time. Uh, we do have some conversations that, we, that take place on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month right now. In it, we, we kind of attack racism in, in many ways. We will watch a TED Talk and then just have a general conversation about what we saw in the video, make personal connections or do that sort of thing. It's very much uh, open forum. We do not post those conversations. So they are private and held just within the group that attends. So please take a look at that. The next one will be on uh, a week from tomorrow. So that'll be what the 22nd of the month, always at two o'clock. That's a pretty prime time for us. So if you'd like to, please take a look at that and register. Thank you. And without that, with any, any more ado, we will say goodbye. And once again, thank you all for coming today. We appreciate your, your sharing and your listening. Thank you. Bye. Talk, Linda. Bye, Mary. Bye-bye, honey. <laughs> there we go. I can't figure out how to get out.